Warren Buffett's first money-making scheme was reselling packs of gum and bottles of coke he bought from his grandfather's shop, going door-to-door -door around his neighbourhood selling the gum for a two-cent profit, and selling six packs of coke for a five-cent profit. Obviously, this is impressive for a six-year-old, but even back in the 1930s, this was still pocket money. But it sets a precedent. All through his life, Buffett was obsessed with making money. It might surprise you to learn that Buffett was 31 before he made his first million, although that was back in 1961. A million dollars back in 1961 is equivalent to over $10 million in today's money, and Warren certainly had some help at the beginning. His dad was a stockbroker and congressman, and probably gave him some advice on choosing his first stock, which he bought in 1942 when he was 11 years old. Over the five years between the ages of 6 and 11, Buffett saved up $120, around $2,300 in today's money. Not bad for an 11 year old. And throughout this time, Warren had been a complete bookworm, spending most of his free time at the local library reading books about business and investment. He knew he had to get his money working for him, after all, he wasn't going to get rich selling gum and coke. So, in 1942, age 11, he stumped up $115, almost his entire savings, and bought three shares in a company called Cities Services. Cities Services was a good company too. Not only did it own local oil and gas refineries that supplied the whole area, but it also owned the oil and gas fields too. This company drilled the gas, refined the gas, and had a local monopoly on the supply of gas. Now, I'm sure Warren's stockbroker father gave him some input to help Warren pick such solid stock, but this was an early glimpse into Warren's investment genius. Except for one thing. He couldn't hold his nerve. The day-to-day -day changes in the stock price made him nervous, as the price kept dipping below what he had paid. He couldn't handle it, and he cashed out as soon as the price went back up, eventually pocketing a $5 profit. This turned out to be an expensive lesson for Warren, because after he sold, the price kept rising. A few months after he cashed out, the stock soared to $200 apiece. If he'd held his position, he could have made nearly $500 profit, instead of a measly five. We'll be circling back to this later, because what Warren learns from this mistake will shape the rest of his life. But after this, he takes a break from the stock market, and focuses on making more cash. He takes a few paper rounds, delivering multiple newspapers door to door, and by the time he was 14 years old, he had amassed a thousand dollars, around 16,000 in today's money. And as he took on more paper rounds, mornings and evenings, he doubled his money by the time he was 15 to $2,000. Finally, he felt like he had enough money to invest, but this time, he was staying out of the stock market. He bought a 40 acre parcel of land for $1,200 and struck a deal with a nearby farmer. He would let the farmer use his land to grow crops, completely free of charge, but Warren would get 50% of the profit from the crops sold. Finally, Warren had his money working for him. He wouldn't have to lift a finger, and he would keep getting paid his share of the profits from the farm. He kept the farm for five years before selling it on for $2,400, twice the price he paid. Obviously, Warren liked this passive income, so he looked for the next opportunity. And what he landed on was pinball machines. He struck a deal with a friend. Warren would buy old pinball machines that didn't work, and he would pay his friends to fix them up. Once they were ready, he would then strike a deal with the local barbers. He would put the pinball machine in their shop, and they would split the profits 50-50. Who wouldn't take up this offer of money for nothing? Throughout high school, Warren built up a pinball machine empire, before selling on the business for $1,200 before he left to go to university. Through his time at uni, Warren lived off his farmland investment and kept adding to his savings. But in 1949, he read a book that changed his life forever. This was the year that The Intelligent Investor was released by Benjamin Graham, and it taught the principles of value investing. Graham was someone to listen to. He ran a hedge fund, which from its first day up to this point, 13 years later, had outperformed the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The book taught three important facts to consider when investing. The first was how to determine what a company was truly worth, otherwise known as its intrinsic value. The second lesson that it taught is that the stock market's prices swing from too optimistic to too pessimistic, and the prices of stocks don't necessarily reflect their true value. The third lesson was always buy stocks trading for less than their true value. The book taught Warren the mistake he'd made with his earlier investment in Cities Services. Warren had correctly assessed the company's fundamental value that made it a great investment, but the stock price led him astray and made him sell out of panic and caused him to lose out on huge profits. This book from Benjamin Graham gave him a new understanding. The maths doesn't lie. If a company's fundamentals are solid, a dip in the stock price isn't a reason to panic, it's an opportunity to buy at a discount. 
Warren read the Intelligent Investor over and over, and started to read the Moody's and the Standard & Poor's manuals as he built up an internal knowledge of multiple industries and industry-leading companies. At this point, in 1949, Warren was 19 years old and was worth around $9,000, over 100000 in today's money. This was when Warren learned that Zeidel, Benjamin Graham, the writer of The Intelligent Investor and Hedge Fund Manager, was teaching at Columbia Business School. When he learned this, he applied and was accepted to transfer from Wharton to Columbia. Warren had never been a great student before this, getting B's, C's and D's. He never found the topics interesting and was more focused on his side projects making money. But this was different. Graham was teaching a class on investment management and security analysis, effectively a course on how to make money. Suddenly, he was interested and became a straight-A student. In fact, Warren earned an A-plus on this course, the first A-plus he had ever achieved. And as part of his time learning from Graham, he discovered that his lecturer was a chairman of a company called Governmental Employees Insurance Company, later known as Geico. Interested, Warren read up in the car insurance business. The insurance companies were the original big data firms. They gather all the data of car accidents and claims and calculate how much it would cost to insure that person. And if it will cost the company an average of $300 to insure someone's car for a year, then they charge $400. It's the perfect business for an investor like Warren Buffett. In fact, by 1951, when Warren was 21, 65% of his net worth was in Geico. This turned out to be another great investment by Warren, as the stock soared up in value by 50% the following year. Now, this was the year that Warren graduated from university and took a job as a stockbroker in his father's firm. This wasn't what Warren wanted, he wanted to work for Benjamin Graham, but Graham was only employing Jews at his firm, as the rest of the finance industry were refusing to hire Jews due to rampant anti-Semitism. So for the next three years, Warren worked as a stockbroker and kept an eye out for great stocks. He kept in touch with Benjamin Graham, visiting him regularly and sharing stock tips, until in 1954 he finally convinced Graham to hire him the first non-Jew to work for his fund. Warren was the top employee at Graham's firm, and was even asked to take over the operation in 1956 when Graham wanted to retire. However, Warren turned the offer down. Having learned all he could from his idol, he was ready to make a move on his own. At this point, Warren was now 26 years old and was worth approximately $175,000, or about $1.7 million in today's money, and so began Warren's first investment partnership of his own. With his great track record from his work with Benjamin Graham, Warren managed to convince nine partners, all close friends and family, to give him their money to invest. All in, the firm had around $300,000. Warren himself contributed $100 as a token investment to show he had money to lose too. He was singularly in charge of deciding where to invest the money. For his partners, they were given 6% annually, and any earnings above that, Warren kept 75% of with the remaining 25% shared amongst the partners. And Warren pulled through. The first year, the firm made 10.4%, $31,600, of which Warren kept around 9500 Some of the rules he set on the partners were that money could only be added or withdrawn once per year, at a set time. This was to avoid having to pull out of investments to pay back partners, that he didn't have to tell anyone where the money was getting invested. He didn't want his partners to invest their money outside of his partnership to avoid paying him his cut. But look at the results over the five years he operated this fund. Dow Jones gained shy of 75%. His partnership gained 250%. Even after Warren's cut, the partners had still gained over 180%. His incredible results spoke for themselves. In fact, many in the finance industry thought Buffett was operating a Ponzi scheme. Nevertheless, as more and more people heard of Warren's success, he opened up more and more partnership funds, as more and more people wanted a piece of the pie. And by 1961, the assets under his management totaled $7.2 million. Warren Buffett's share of this was $1,025,000.